Ah, uh, yes, you can laugh now, but hear me out. I've got business for you, and I can tell by you fine folks you're all good people of business. And luckily for you, Don Refusio, that's me, I'm here to interest you in many of your fulfilling business needs, if you catch my meaning. And perhaps I can fulfill those needs by producing one of my various pocket items you might be interested in purchasing. Uh, for example, uh, who here might be interested in purchasing what I got, uh, uh, a couple of uh, toenail clippers here that I uh, definitely did not pick off the ground. <laughs> No? Okay, well, uh, how about this pen that I certainly did not um, grab off of a desk earlier today? It, this belongs to me, and I'm willing to... Okay, not that. All right, that's fine. Okay, well, how about this? What if I told you I have a time machine? Because I could easily take us back to the year 2016. Behold! I don't know what this is, but it was a big deal back then. Okay, not that. All right, that's fine. <laughs> All right, you pulled my arm. I'm willing to present to you something extraordinary. One of the most dangerous, most lethal weapons known to man that I would not present to you if I didn't trust all of you here. But I am a man of trust, so I am willing to present to you the tongue! Not just any tongue, it is the tongue. This little bad boy here is responsible for conflict everywhere. I'm talking relationships, family, friendships, my marriage. <laughs> this baby is the reason for causing pain to it all. I mean, if you think about it, the tongue is probably the reason most lies exist. Or that nations are <laughs> divided. Or um, uh, that... You know, like, government is screwed up. You know what? Uh, you know, I uh, pitched this uh, to one of my friends earlier, and uh, it sounded good then. Um, it does not sound good now. So I'm just going to hold on to that and uh, burn it when I have the chance. <laughs> because, uh, you know, this thing's been eating me out of house and home, both of which are currently a dumpster. So uh, perhaps uh, we could uh, do something else. Like, uh, who here would be interested in uh, purchasing this patented watch? Or at least it would be if I wasn't fired from the patenting office for trying to patent sadness. But that's, uh, okay, none of that, that, wait, who's that? Is that my ex-wife? Oh, she, leave me alone! You already took the case, what more do you want? Thank you to the gangster in the house. James chapter three, last Sunday we spoke on the power of the tongue and how not to speak, the things not to do. Today we're gonna to look at things to do, but we are gonna do a little bit of a review. But first let's read our text for today. Verse five, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. He talked about a little bit controlling a big horse, a little rudder steering a big ship, and a little fire kindling a great big fire. See how great a force the little fire kindles, verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles a whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, who's been to Sea World, who's been to a circus, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Once in a great while, the animals leave their training and we have a disaster. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father. Hallelujah. And with it, we curse men. We blankety blank blank you. I'm going to say something offensive about your mother. The same mouth can do the same thing. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude, can you say image, of God. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring 
send forth fresh water, water and bitter from the same opening? No. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? No, if it did, I wouldn't want to taste them. Or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. Next paragraph, verse 13 and 14. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct. Who knows that speaking is part of our conduct? So let him show by good behavior and good speaking that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. If you're being wise, you don't always have to be the loudest voice in the room. Verse 14, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Envy is a huge problem in the world. The advertising world, if you're in the advertising business, forgive me for this, but the advertising world does its best to stir it up. If you envy your neighbor's vehicle, you may go into debt that you shouldn't just to have a car as good as his. If you envy where your kids go to school, you may find yourself going into debt just to keep up with the Joneses. The point is, envy is not good, and envy has an impact on the things we say and the things we listen. You may not speak ill of the envious of the person you envy, but then when you hear some bad news, you know, like, like their beauty queen daughter got caught driving drunk, something inside you doesn't mourn. A little bit of a rejoicing. You may actually spread that news around. So you got to watch out for that green-eyed devil called envy. That's not the topic today. So our hub verse for this whole concept of controlling our tongues is death and life, Proverbs 18, 21, are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So what, what would the fruit be? The fruit of death or the fruit of life? So last week, or two weeks ago, we spoke on the fruit of an untamed tongue. If you were not here or you were here, I encourage you to listen to it. It's, it's very important, not because of me, but because of the truth. It is important. It will save you a world of hurt in your life and help your relationships stay together and your ministry be effective and your life be fruitful from the truth that were shared two weeks ago. Verse 26 of the first chapter of this book says, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his or her own heart, this person's religion is vain. Vanity. It's no no good. So the controlling of our tongues is so important. So today we're going to talk about what to say, but last week, we, last time I spoke, we spoke on what not to say or how not to speak. So I just want to do a quick review on it even though you're going to listen to it again or for the first time online. An untamed tongue can be inflaming. It can absolutely set things on fire. You ever be in a conflict and think, how in the world did things go this far? The Hatfields and McCoys, the Montagues and... and uh, yes. Uh, how did things go that far in such the conflict? Somebody said, oh, no, you didn't. Pop their neck and let out a lot of hurtful words, and vice versa. And before you know it, you have the war going on because of the inflammation of the tongue, the inflaming of the tongue. The untamed tongue can be a world of iniquity. I mean, there is so much iniquity in us without Jesus cleansing us. There's a world of behaviors you cannot believe we'd be involved in that our tongue can get us in the middle of, our voices, our words. It can be contagious. Gossip spreads like wildfire. Uh, and Jesus knew it. He actually used it. When he healed somebody, he said, don't tell anybody. And they go out and just spread all the news. It is set on fire by hell. There's something evil about an uncontrolled tongue. It is, an uncontrolled tongue is untamable. You can hold it back. Put tape over your mouth. Well, just give me a keyboard and I've got something to share. So the, the tongue is a metaphor for the pen sometimes. It's untamable by human efforts without the Lord. Who knows the Lord can help us tame our tongues. He gives us grace. The tongue that is untamed can be polluting. 
It can pollute our praise. And I pray that this next slide is seared into all of our brains. A hypocrite is a person who's not himself on Sunday. I mean, think about it. You're yourself six days a week. Come Sunday, here comes the sanctimonious garb, you know. Some churches make a big deal out of wearing coats and ties. That's great. You know, you go see the president, dress up the, their best for them. I, I, I knew that growing up. Went to a church. If you were poor, you had to, you had to get some hand-me-down clothes to match the culture of the church because we dressed up all the time for all kinds of stuff. And that's fine. But dressing up cannot be a cover-up. It can be. But we must make sure we're not just a bunch of stuffed shirts and ties putting on an act that is not God. That's why I, I like this. We, we worshiped at Country Love Theater for years. That old A-frame auditorium is the old First Baptist Church. The bail bondsman that bought it couldn't afford to, you know, air condition his, his uh, country shows with adequate air conditioning. So we were cooled by three window units, and one was a small one. So the summertime baked the ties off of us. <laughs> we were already leaning that way anyway. So, and so now we got our own building. We could do it if we wanted. But, and, if you, and if you wear a tie, that's fine. If anyone's here wearing a tie, please, please, I'm not picking on you. I'm just making a point about not putting on airs. So who you are on Monday, if it's not who we are on Sunday, what is that? That's hypocrisy which relates to wearing a mask. So moving right on with a review of the message, an unclaimed tongue, untamed tongue can be polluting our praise and piercing like a sword. There's scripture that goes with all of these things that I'm saying, and it can be ensnaring. You ever been trapped by your own words? Oh, how am I gonna get out of this one? One lie leads to another lie, leads to another lie, and then you've got a whole monstrosity on your hands. <laughs> Always tell the truth. That way you won't struggle with remembering what you said. It can ensnare our lives and it even can affect us spiritually. It can ensnare our souls, which is the center part of us, but it's also our lives. It's the whole of us as well. The suke part of us is the whole person. Proverbs 18.7 says, a fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul, ensnaring our souls. So that's the fruit of an untamed tongue in review, but today we're gonna to talk about the fruit of a tamed tongue. Can we say tamed? Tamed. So back to our hub scripture, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life. Can we say life? Life. Or in the power of the tongue. Can we say words? Words, words of life or words of death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So we're talking about words of life. That's my favorite, my favorite fruit. Grapefruit. It's awesome. It wakes you up in the morning. And a little juice, about a quarter, cup of, quarter of a glass of juice, the rest water. Man, that's so refreshing. All right, done with the commercial. A tame tongue can be like a trained horse. This is on the cover of your bulletin today. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. The last part of James 3, 2, which continues with verse 3. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths. Horses are about 1,200 pounds. A bit isn't even a pound. That we, they may obey us and we turn their whole body. So if we speak destructively, it's powerful, right? But we don't like those results. But if we speak constructively, that is also power. So these verses apply both directions. In the positive, the spiritual, the biblical way, you can impact your life by the words you speak. If you're a negative person, people will run from you unless they want to join in. And then you just put you in worse shape. Build a stronghold. You gotta watch it and come into an agreement with people on negative, hurtful things. Maybe they are true things. But if you come into agreement with the person, then they won't really get themselves set free because you're holding them to the, the words they said about somebody. 
and vice versa. It's so destructive to come into agreement with people when it's not biblical practice. Someone's hurt you, go to them. Get things right. A tame tongue can be like a ship's rudder. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Any skippers in the house? If your rudder breaks, you've got a problem. Got a problem. A good sailor will figure out what to do. So, just as this works in the negative, so it works in the spiritual side of things. It can help your life make progress for God. Not always for you in the immediate, immediate sense, but for God in the eternal sense, you'll love the results of yielding your tongue to him. A tame tongue can be like a fire starter. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. It can start a fire. You know, fire is not bad if it's in the right place, right? Right. Kind of like sex. Sex in the right place is awesome. It creates children and holds husbands and wives together in communion. But beyond that, it creates all sorts of disaster, destroys families, families, destroys homes, ruins people's health, spreads disease, and occupies space in our minds that the Lord wants to occupy. Can we say amen to the word of the Lord? So we want to start a fire in the right place, good place, in the fireplace, in the hearts of believers who are fired up to serve him. That's why we encourage one another. We, we come on, baby, light their fire for the Lord. A tame tongue can be a source of wisdom. Who has ever received wisdom from someone? I was a newlywed and going to college, Bible college, and a retired sergeant was a fellow classmate. And he took me aside one day and gave me a good rebuking in love. He said, sir, you need to shave every day. The denomination I was in, you couldn't have beards, but you needed to shave. But I would get a little scraggly some days. You're a married man. You need to shave every day. And you need to wear T-shirts. I've worn T-shirts ever since. (laughs) Sleeve T-shirts was his instructions. The words of wisdom changed my life. I'm not condemning anybody that doesn't do that, but apparently I needed it. (laughs) Who is wise and understanding among you? Verse 13. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And works include our talking, our writing, our communication. Psalm 37, verse 30, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom and his tongue talks of justice. It's God's will that we yield. Speaking is part of the nature of God. Animals can grunt and call and convey communication in weird ways. Oh, look, the monkey waved at his friend. I mean, yeah, whoop de doo But we humans speak with great skill. Where did we get that? We were created in the image of God. And he did not give us that ability to ruin lives, ruin our own lives, or prey on foolishness and hurt people. He gave it for speaking wisdom, for righteous we will Focus our tongues on doing that. Proverbs 10, the mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom. Verse 31, but the perverse tongue will be cut out. Eventually, your words are going to die, but destruction happens in the process. Process or process. Verse 32, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse? You know how to turn the air blue? Or you know how to speak words of life, words of wisdom. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it, we all love to talk, will eat the fruit thereof. You will eat the fruit of your words. We will eat our words. So what are we serving ourselves? Proverbs 16, 23. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth, 
and adds learning to his lips. We're going beyond not saying certain things. We're going into the do's, from the don'ts to the do's. Teach your mouth and add learning to your lips. If you don't know what to say, you know, you feel awkward around people, you don't know what to say, it's so easy just to get critical. If nothing else, just say, isn't it nice we're having weather? <laughs> but read something. Listen to something. Beware of what you're listening to. There's some good podcasts I could recommend. I won't go there right now. That to fill your mind with things so that when, I, when opportunities to have a conversation happen, you got something to say. But if you're not a podcast listener, if you're not a reader, here is the key, the key, the key. When I first became a pastor... Here, I really struggled performing weddings for strangers and funerals for people I did not know. As a pastor, sometimes you're called upon doing that. And I was at Kinko's one day, and they have a little bookshelf there of motivational materials. And one was a book on tape called The Greatest Word Word in the World. So I listened to it. And the greatest word in the world to people is their name. So it was tips on remembering people's names. It didn't take. It didn't change my life. I remember your face, but if you notice me when I introduce you to people, you may realize he doesn't know my name. It takes a while for me. But the other thing it shared, it was on side B, it changed my life. How to have a conversation with strangers. Talk to them about their favorite subject. Themselves. Well, that's not very righteous, but it's real. Come up with questions to ask them. Get them talking. And an hour later when the conversation is over, they really won't know you, but you'll know them. And you might remember their name. You know, how long you've been in Texas? Uh, never ask, is this your first time at Generations? Just ask, how long have you been coming? <laughs> how long have you been worshiping with us? Um, do you work outside the home? Don't say, do you work? Oh, that's offensive. Do you work outside the home? And never ask, when's the baby due? <laughs> never, 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 never. I have a pastor friend that did that, and she says, my child was born six months ago. All right. Tame tongue can be a source of wisdom. Jesus said in Luke 7, 35, wisdom is justified by all her children. The fruit of your life will prove if there's just a bunch of foolishness going on or if there's wisdom. You may not see the fruit right now of wisdom in your life, but fast forward five years and your life will be impacted. More can happen in five years than you think can happen. And less can happen in a year than you think can happen too, but... Five years of fruit of wisdom, God, the seed of God's wisdom bears fruit every time. It just takes a while. Do you know wisdom will reduce the number of personal prayer requests in your life? It doesn't remove them all, but it definitely removes those self-inflicted wound prayer requests. Wisdom. Can we say wisdom? <laughs> a tame tongue can be a means of being blessed. Luke 34, 12. Who is the man who desires life? And loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Peter was impressed with this verse. He quoted it in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 10. He who would love life and see good days, who, who's that? Anybody here love life and you want to see good days? <laughs> refrain, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. King James says guile. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So when you pray, do you, want, do you want the Lord to respond to your prayer with, talk to the hand? Talk to the hand. 
No, we want his ears to be open to our prayer. This is why speaking words of faith, words of truth, words of wisdom will empower your prayer life because God will listen to you. He won't listen to sin. And so if you sin a whole bunch with your mouth, maybe he just turns you off till you repent. I don't, I don't know. I know the Lord is so merciful. Who's glad the Lord is merciful? So merciful. A tame tongue can be like medicine. It's medicinal. Proverbs 12, 18. The tongue of the wise promotes health. Can we say healthy? A wholesome tongue, Proverbs 15, 4, is a tree of life. But perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Why are Abraham's biological children so blessed. Well, God made a promise to him, right? And he gave a warning as well. Those who are not kind to your seed, you know, they're not going to be blessed. But they have in their culture Shabbat, those that practice their faith. And part of the Shabbat meal is speaking blessing over their children. Laying hands on their head, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. We need to incorporate that in our culture. Because we have the better covenant and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Man, prophesy over those little guys every week. Do it. What does a normal Gentile household do? Where's that blankety-blank kid at? Cursing their own children. Berating them, giving them the gifts they were given from their fathers. So they're getting drunk on Friday nights and cursing their kids. No wonder our kids turn out to be horrible. Sometimes, sometimes. Not speaking well of, ill of yours, though. Yours are just awesome children. <laughs> because you're speaking words of life over them. A tame tongue can be our protection. Proverbs 13, 3, he who guards his mouth preserves his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Did you hear the story of the wide-mouthed frog that went through the jungle asking them, what do you feed your babies? He asked the elephant, what do you feed your babies? And the elephant said, berries and twigs. He asked the giraffe, what do you feed your babies? The giraffe said, twigs, leaves that they can reach. We're vegans. Okay. He walked up to a crocodile and said, what do you feed your babies? The crocodile said, wide mouth frogs. <laughs> the wide mouth frog said, oh, you do, do you? <laughs> Nothing to do with a sermon, just an attention getter. If we guard our mouth, we preserve our life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Can we say protection? <laughs> Proverbs 21, 23, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Oh, Lord, help us see. Help us see our part in the storms we go through sometimes in our relationships. A soft answer turns away wrath. Sometimes people will go to you, and depending on, depending on your response, they'll get even more angry, and then you have a bigger problem. So silence is best, but if you must answer, give a soft answer, a loving answer. Why pour gasoline on the fire that's already burning? Well, they got a butt chewing coming. Well, welcome to your future. Won't stop. A tame tongue can be teachable. It can be. Teach me, Lord, how to speak. Psalm 39.1, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. Who would say that's a great New Year's resolution? Good luck with that. The president of the Philippines, the one they had a few years ago, President Duarte, 
made a big speech one day. He was known for profanity and cursing and epithets galore. I mean, it was horrible how he spoke publicly. And he was on a plane ride one night flying from maybe one of the Philippine islands back home. And he said, God spoke to him, says, I'm taking you out if you don't stop the cussing. So he made a big speech. You're never going to hear me because God, I heard God tell me. It was a two-week till someone irritated him, and here comes again. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We're really talking about our hearts. Fill our hearts with good things, and we will say good things. So you can't control your tongue if you don't feed your heart on good things. A tame tongue can be teachable with the Lord's help always. So later on in the 39th Psalm, look at what David says because there's some stuff he's acknowledging, stuff that's going on that is helping him to shut his mouth. He said, now, Lord, what do I wait for? It's seven verses later. My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the reproach of the foolish. Can you say repentance? Yes. He is turning from his wickedness. And look at what happens. I was mute. I did not open my mouth because it was you who did it. The Lord allowed a number to be done on him. So he learned to hush. The title of this series is called Fixes for Fruitful Faith. It's not just to fix your faith up, but it's to get a fix. In the world of navigation, they call it getting a fix. To get a fix on where you are so that you can see where to go. Your GPS will not work in giving you directions to a certain location until it determines where you're located. So in listening to this talk, if you're getting located by the word, because I'm just up here preaching in the dark, if, if you're getting located, then listen up. Don't be condemned. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, preacher, that's true. Listen to the rest of the verse. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's the condition for not having condemnation. If you walk after the flesh, you're going to be condemned, condemned all the time because of the fruit of our life. Preaching to myself here. David was taught by the Lord, and he uses enemies to do it. <laughs> A tame tongue can be life-giving. So now we're coming home time. What can we do to speak words of life? We have the scriptures. The 23rd Psalm is the greatest confession of faith in the Old Testament. You can declare it by faith. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Memorize. The Bible is full of faith confessions. The word confess means to agree with. So we confess our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we confess our sins means we agree with God that this attitude, this behavior, these words are sinful. They separate me from God and from my fellow man. So we come into agreement with God in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. So having come into agreement with God, then we come into agreement with God, God, that he is our shepherd. We shall not want, we won't be worrying about stuff because we trust our shepherd. This teaching can change your life by giving you a whole new approach to reading the scriptures. Now, I appreciate the Word of Faith movement. They helped me read my Bible. But I didn't stay with them because I noticed they too had parts of the Bible they would explain away. But when you read the whole book, there's nothing wrong with being honest with your, with your problems. Nothing wrong with saying, man, I'm hurt." Some word of faith churches in the foyer, if you confess some weakness, boy, they'll rebuke you. Don't say that. That's a bad confession. And what are you supposed to do with this pain? You can't share it anywhere, so you're faking it till you make it. We're supposed to faith it till we make it. We agree with God. David would lament 
and tell his real problems and, and complain to God, but not falsely accuse God. Like, God, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous not do so good? But God meets us at the point of our honesty. Before the end of the psalm, here comes the revelation. Then I went to the house of the Lord and I remembered, I'm going to heaven and the wicked are not. <laughs> Sorry for distilling it down to simple terms, but that's basically what it is. So, responsibility is, our, is ours to be aware of what's in our heart because it's going to impact the words we say. Now we're going to talk about what to put in our heart, what to agree with. We don't name it and claim it in the sense of creating things with our mouths that are not in alignment with Scripture. Well, I'm going to be the richest man in the world. Yes, you are. Just say it again and again. I'm going to create my own reality. It doesn't work like that. We agree with God. If you're called to be the richest man in the world, it's not, a, it's not going to be because you said so. Abraham didn't run around, I'm going to be the father of faith. No, God told him. And then he repeated what God said sometimes. When he did, it got him in trouble, right? So look at this confession of faith. Philippians 1, verse 3. This is for other people. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Verse 4, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing. And here it is. He who has begun a good work in you shall complete it, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Can we repeat that to ourselves? He who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Can we do that? He who... Say it again. Lord, erase all the tapes on our head. Help us re-record this promise. Thank you, Lord. Job, great problems. I noticed the word of faith movement, as quick as they could, explained Job away. Well, he said, the thing he feared came upon him the most. And God did restore everything, so let's move on. What's next? Well, God bragged on him. If fear was a problem... God would have said, he's a fearful man. It was the worst thing that could happen, what went through him. And then his friends, three friends came and stared at him for seven days, not saying anything. And then they began to say the smartest, insulting, hurtful things you can imagine. Like one or two, one or two chapters devoted to each guy when they would open their mouth and talk. Seven days of staring and then... Here comes a chapter or two of just lambasting him. And then he would speak up and defend himself. And in the midst of one of his defenses, in Job 19, verse 23, comes these words of faith. He's lamenting. My wife can't stand me, can't stand me no more. Little, ch little children run from me because my breath is so bad. Then here in the midst of that, that lamenting comes this word from God. In the New Covenant, we understand this is a sword. Who knows, a mouth is like a sword. This is a sword to use. He should have responded to his enemies, his so-called friends, with these words over and over again. But he didn't. He dropped his sword, and then he got into making some errors that the Lord corrected. So in the midst of this lamenting, Job 19, 23, he said, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. They were. That they are engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. And he's speaking of what he's about to say. And here it is. Verse 25 of Job 19, 19. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. And it happened before the end of the book. This phrase has inspired more songs than any other verse in the book of Job. I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. This is actually a, me 
a messianic promise for us. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. So let's just read verse 25 together. I know. You may be in deep doo-doo, in need of redemption, and may not know how redemption's going to come. But take this to the bank. Your Redeemer li lives. You may be the sickest you've ever been in your life and not know how healing's going to come. But take it to the bank. Your healer lives. You may be as lost as a goose in a hailstorm, not knowing how to get out of your mess. You need a Savior. You can take it to the bank. Your Savior lives. I could go on. The congregation that's been here for years has heard this rant more than once. So they can preach the other ones to you. You may not know how provision's going to come, but your provider lives. He is the answer. What am I going to do? I am. Where am I going to go? I am. How can, how can I get out of this? I am. The I am answer is the answer to all of our problems. Let's confess it by faith. He lives. All right, respond to this. Christ is risen. He is risen Amen. We read this at the men's Bible study last Tuesday. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Against that day in the King James Version. Someone put this to music in the 1800s. In 1840, the Whittle family was blessed with a son whom they named Daniel Webster because in their younger days, they got to hear the aging Daniel Webster make a speech. And he said, by the grace of God, it is my sentiment, independence now and independence forever. He was a great patriot till he so they named their son Daniel Webster. And he loved the Lord. And the Civil War came upon the land. And he signed up to fight for the North and got married the day before he left. And then the cares of the world got a hold of him. And he just became, as he, in his own words, he became wicked. And in battle, it fell to him. He became a major to lead a charge, and his sword arm got wounded so much, I don't know which, that he wound up losing it. So now he has one arm, and he's healing up in a POW camp. And I think it was the North POW camp. They didn't have hospitals then. You know, if the Civil War didn't kill you, the doctors did. <laughs> and he read a New Testament that his mother gave him every day. And one day a nurse came to him and said, there's a, there's a young man crying out for someone to come pray for him. He doesn't know God. And Major Daniel Webster Riddler said, I am a wicked man. I can't do it. Well, I see you reading your New Testament every day and I never hear you curse. So I want you to go do it. So he did laid hands on the young man and repented for his own wickedness before he prayed for the young man. The young man wept and received his prayer and died. That experience drew Daniel Webster Whittler back to the Lord. And after the Civil War, he became friends with Dwight L. Moody and wrote the lyrics to over 200 songs. And this verse, the last part of 2 Timothy 1.12, inspired him. It goes like this. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Let's sing it together. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. The verses are amazing. He says, first verse, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, 
nor why unworthy, Christ in love, redeem me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word brought peace within my heart. I know not how the spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the word, creating faith in him. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me, a weary ways or golden days before his face I see. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. In the air. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You know, most of the songs we sing are confessions of faith. I'm being totally spontaneous here. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I'll never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus because he never let me down. He's faithful through generations. You got, got to give him some time. So why would he fail now? I still got joy and chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength because I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. I'm safe with you, and I'm going to make it through. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, confessing words of faith. And then I speak Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Talk about a word of faith. The name of Jesus. When I'm at my end, you're just getting started. When I hit a wall, you just walk through. When I face a mountain, you are the maker. So it's got to move. When I'm out of faith, you are still faithful. Oh, my gosh. When I'm at my worst, you are still good. In all of my questions, you are the answer. It all points to you. Because you're the God of the breakthrough when I'm breaking down. You're working a way through when there's no way out. This one thing I know, you're still on my throne. On your throne, not mine. So whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason to praise. Out of our wrongs, you write our story. <laughs> Out of the cross come rivers of grace. Out of the grave bursts a revival no tomb can contain. When you come around, dry bones come to life. Deserts to paradise. Stones just start rolling away. When you come around, my heart starts to beat again. Lungs stretch to breathe again. Souls just erupt into praise. Who gets inspired by the Lord? So these are songs, but they are statements to make in the face of discouragement. So let's, let's say you wake up tomorrow and you feel like your life is just one big country song that's not played backwards. You've lost your truck, your dog died, your mama passed, and your woman left you. Look in the mirror and say, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Begin to speak words of life to yourself that align with Scripture. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that your word would take root in our lives in such a way we walk our talk and we talk our walk and Sunday morning hypocrisy comes to an end. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we live for you just like we do on Sunday. Lord, make these songs come to life. And Lord, give us songs. Give us lyrics. Give us poetry. Give us insight from your word as we read it. Hey, I need to claim that. I need to speak that by faith in Jesus. 
You know, our shield in battle is faith. And our sword is the word of God. So pick up your weapons and fight. Don't go down like this. Fight for the real thing. Fight for the right thing. Fight in such a way that if you die, we don't have to lie at your funeral. Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new. So I surrender all. And all I want is to live within your love. Be undone.
hearts to the Lord to be filled by his spirit and to receive his word. So Lord, in this moment, may the word that we've heard take root in our lives. Let's confess this together. Paul made this statement. It can be true of you, or maybe it has been true of you, or maybe it is true of you now, or it will be in the future. This is a confession that is amazing. Let's read it together. We are, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed, we are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body of the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. That's Hector Corinthians. Eight through ten. He continues at verse thirteen. Let's read this together. And, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that He who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus, and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. You say amen. Amen. The audible reading of scripture is powerful. The Lord knows our mouths are used for foolishness too long. It's time to proclaim the word of God. One final text, Galatians 2.20. Let's repeat this together. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. I picked on the Word of Faith movement today. I'm very grateful for them. If it wasn't for them, I would still be stuck in the thing I was in got me reading my Bible. And it all began with someone giving me a little book called Words by Kenneth Hagin. It was a mini book. It changed our lives. And Yvette and I came to the place to encourage one another to realize the impact of our words. This is what we would say when we would be tempted to complain or moan or groan or make some negative prediction about our lives. I would say to her or she would say to me, you know what? I believe you're a prophet, and everything you say comes to pass. Ooh, oh, you do, do you? Let's read this one more time. I know who I believe, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Our youth group ends with this confession every Wednesday. Miss Yvette put it together years ago, Pastor Yvette did. And Joseph has continued the custom because it's biblical. I am blessed of God. I am called to bless others. In fact, I'm going to read it to you, and then Joseph will lead us in reading it together. Can we do that? All right. I am blessed of God. I am called to bless others. I am who God says I am. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right, Joseph, take us away. All right, repeat after me. I am blessed of God. I am blessed of God. I am called to bless others. I am called to bless others. I am who God says I am. I am who God says I am. And I can do all things. And I can do all things. Through Christ. Through Christ. Who strengthens me. Hallelujah. Go get them, Tigers. Change the world with the word of God.